almost caught her palla and followed her wherever she went. Theatre and the arts were certainly her very own, but even more was the fragrance of the flowers and the jasmine that she wore on herself. Immaculately dressed to the last, her coiffure was the natural feminine who could match with a smile that this arming smile, any masculine power. She was a person who gave dignity, as has been said rightly, by both Dr. Call and Dr. Sarkar, to the crafts and the craftsperson. She was a person who gave us, the middle class, the dignity to wear the clothes that we wear because we would still be in those georgets and chauffants. And yet, there are miles to go because this was not the end of her agenda. And it is to this Kamla Devi, that the memorial lecture is dedicated. Naturally, since the moment of agreeing, my mind has been full of memories, 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 memories. And I don't know where to begin and where to stop. But I, this lecture is not about my memories but two episodes may give some insight to this, this Kamla Devi. On one occasion, and both the president of this lecture as also the chairman of the CCRTR, high officers, I thought I was also one once upon a time. We sat in a formal meeting and I began to argue with Kamla Devi on something or the other, I don't know what. And I said, you know, we should do this, we should not do that. And some of the people who are here know what a foolish person I can be. And she just turned around and said, you shut up! You were too heavy to carry on that salt march in your party and I had to hand you over to your mother before I went to the court to sell that freedom salt before I got arrested. And she then smiled as only she could. And said, I think she has a good argument. You might want to listen to her. On another occasion, even more moving, Ma was in hospital ill. Kamala Devi came in to see her. The two women held hands, exchanged whatever they did through eyes. No words were spoken. Kamala Devi came out, and as she was going to sit in her car, I opened the door. And I said, Kamla Deviji, thank you for coming to see my mother. You know what it would mean to her. She snapped back. What impertinence. I knew your mother before you were born. And she held my hands, said, look after her. That was Kamla Devi. These two very personal recollections, which I have shared publicly for the first time in my life, give some insight into the character of this person at the most human level, 
as also the person, as I narrated in the episode with, or the conversation with Jawaharlal Nehru at the public level. She indeed, as she was called in the days of her studenthood in Britain, the uncrowned queen of India, wherever she sat, she was a special presence as a unique, all the time, standing for the causes in which she believed. I watched her from near and far, not only in that personal, but watched her and followed her. Faridabad, Nilokheri, and when both she and my mother jumped on to those bucket seats when the first Kabailis came to Kashmir, not leaving a note behind to work with women underground, or when she sat regally in the Asian Relations Conference with Sarojini Naidu, with me as volunteer, <coughs> along with Lakshmi Chand Jain. And this was Kamla Devi, Kamla Devi, who recounts much of this in that book, beautiful book, which I would recommend that CCRT may make extracts available to the teachers to inspire them. Inner resources and outer spaces. She gives a vivid account of her own life. And despite all those reprimands that I got, she's given me that book with the inscription to my most precious companion of inner recesses. And it is there that she says something which is of relevance to the subject of this memorial lecture, because she gives an account of her conversation with Maulana Azad about the establishment of cultural institutions <laughs> in independent India. And that account is very educative, because the Maulana tells her how he wants to establish the academies and makes it quite clear that it is not academy, but academy, from the Greek word academy. And without <coughs> deviating, Johar, let me tell you that as a very good senior or junior officer, I was made to write academy a hundred times by the Maulana because I spread it as academy. Kapila ko ye hidayat di jati hai ki wo academy likhe aur academy nahi likhe. Aur abhi tak mujhe jithiyan aati hain usi ministry se jis mein likha hua hota hai academy. That part. And so she quotes the Maulana to say, it will <clears throat> canalize fruitfully the new culture, cultural forces released after independence. While I believe that the arts have to derive their sustenance only from the people, the government must also come in. But the government should come in only in a very limited way the academies will, however, be fully autonomous, underlined, in their internal working. There will be representatives from state governments, but much more, there will be representatives of individual artists. And Kamla Devi gives a full account of this conversation with the Maulana. She also then gives a full account of the establishment of the Asian Theatre Institute, with which I had a little role to play with Kamla Devi 
It was my privilege to work with her there. And she gives a fuller account of the establishment of the Bharti Nati Sangh, where I happen to be her general secretary, and the establishment of the National School of Drama. I mention all these because Sri Sarkar is today responsible for them. And as some of you know, as her vice chairman in the Sangeet Natak Academy, and of course the CCRT. I have looked at the work of the CCRT with which I was connected, as some of you might remember, in prehistoric times, in the first years of its existence, but I thought I might tell you its prehistory a little bit, because it began as a small scheme in the University of Delhi when Dr. V.K.R.V. Rao was the Vice Chancellor. And this was started as a scheme called the Propagation of Arts Amongst Students in the University. And it was a, as a result of that that the Department of Music was started in the University of Delhi. And things as has happened when Dr. Rao came to the ministry and some of us were his colleagues, we persevered and persevered in not a very easy job, as you know, God, and as you will know better as you go along, to mm, try and convince people that this was also a field to be looked at. And it was persistence at many levels which led to the establishment of the CCRT. And the CCRT, as I see from its publications, which I've seen after many decades, I see that they have gone much further and there has been a great deal of enlargement. There are two other centers, one in Hyderabad and the other, I understand, in Udaipur. I looked at some of the publications. They're all very impressive and also very educative and I plan to look at them a little more to educate myself. I have no doubt that with Mr. P.C. Sain at the helm of affairs, there will be many other avenues that would be opened up. And the one avenue which I would like to stress, which has, something has been done, but which is the subject of my lecture here today, and that is how exactly do we interweave the great creativity of this country at what is known as the unorganized se sector into the curriculum of the educational system in the formal sector, to put it very briefly. Then where do I begin? I can begin with Vedic Patshalas, I can begin with Palini, I can tell you what Palini said, I can go into the predecessor, my predecessor, Vatsyayan, and the classification of the 64 Kalas. I can go into the Karkhana system. I can go into the Buddhist songs. I can go into the Jain Shrenis. I can go into all this. But this is not what I plan to do today, because both that books have been written on it, and that is not a subject absolutely relevant to, relevant, very relevant, but choices are to be made. And for purposes, therefore, I am not going to take you to the whole history of the establishment of what one calls in any of the streams of Indian thought and systems of the establishment of educational institutions, their curricula, their framework, and what the monks did in Nalanda or Takshila or any of these other places. I have decided to take a great jump and that jump is a history, a history, let me tell you, I'm not being at all parochial, but when I started to work on it, I found that I was not in Delhi at all. I was in your hometown, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> and I was in your hometown, Mr. President. I couldn't escape it, because everything seemed to end. It happened to be my childhood also. But everything was happening in Calcutta. Everything 
and the subtitle or an alternate title of my lecture, and I address myself specially to Mr. Sartar. Well, number one Park Street and College Square ever meet or Belvedere? That's it. Nothing further needs to be said. And therefore, I thought it might be interesting without taking you through the history of colonial India or the history of modern India as we were taught in college of P. Roberts, if you'll remember, I would take you through that history in a slightly different way through a detour. And what is that history? What was happening roughly about the 17th century in Europe first, to the 18th and the early 19th century, and what was happening in India just about that time, and how both these movements have a direct bearing on what we're going to be talking about as we go along. Education through the arts, values and skills, each of these four words are loaded problematic words. But thus, it is Europe in the 17th, 18th, and early 19th century. It is India in that time. It is then what has been critiqued by a whole group of scholars in this country during the last two decades of the nationalist discourse and the critique of that nationalist discourse having been rejected, and I want to bring that up again. And what is it that happens in terms of the effects of the socio-political context in which both education and the arts flourish or don't flourish. Between the First and the Second World War and after the Second World War, till we come to our own time, independence here and the post-Second World War scenario in Europe. Big agenda. And therefore, much of this will be in telegraphic language because most of you know more than I do, but it is my duty here to refresh your memories of that long, not so long history, which affects this present moment in which we live, both in the, at the level of perception as also at the level of structures and the manner in which we have looked at these domains of education, culture, the arts. And arts within brackets, in capital, the crafts. And this distinction between the arts and the crafts also has a history, as we know, which is a very recent history. And that is why I refer again to the late, late fifth century Mr. Vatsyayan, who did not make this distinction, and we had 64 colors of a different order. My purpose here is certainly not to go into the philosophic discourses of a Kant and Hegel, even if most writing in India today in the fields of both the social sciences as also the humanities begins with Kant and Hegel. And there's hardly a book, and I have edited three big volumes in the last four or five years, and am well acquainted with that discourse. But needless, I do want to have, and have to, mention the names of Descartes and the Cartesian worldview which affects us of dualism. 
I have then to remind us, ourselves, what happened to the perceptions of the world in terms of fundamental values and looking at this world, the moment we had a mechanistic view, thanks to Mr. Newton, whom we know, and Darwin, whose anniversary we are going to celebrate, and on the other hand, the entire discourse of the Orientalists, which begins with that International Congress of Orientalists in France in the 17th century and ends more or less in 1964 in Vigyan Bhavan in India, where I happen to be the Joint Secretary of the International Congress of Orientalists. And then it is disbanded in France in the 70s because no longer Orientalism is of any use and it takes on this history is important because it affects the manner in which both 